Hi, I'm David Tisch. I'm the managing partner at Box Group, which is an angel investment fund in New York City. I am also the co-founder of Techstars New York, where I ran the first three programs as managing director there. We produce 36 companies over the past three programs, companies like OnSwipe, CrowdTwist, Lore, Contently, um, and 32 uh, others. The biggest commonality amongst the entrepreneurs that show immediate success and the entrepreneurs that struggle right off the bat is passion. I really think the connection of the entrepreneur to the idea and that being a passion point is one of the biggest differentiators between early success and early struggles. My favorite question to ask an entrepreneur is why? Why are you doing this? Why are you going to stop doing everything else in your life and just do this? Why is this important? You know, why does this wake you up in the middle of the night? And I think that those are uh, the most important answers that lead to you deciding if the passion connection's there. You could pretty much tell within the first 10 seconds of an answer, do they sit up higher? Do they get excited? Does their voice uh, check into the conversation more? If it doesn't, they're trying to sell you. If they're engaged, you can feel it. When I'm looking at a company, I look at four things in order. Team, market, product, idea. And it starts with team because it's the hardest thing to change. Idea is the easiest thing to change. And so you're really analyzing across those four buckets and pretty much saying, is the blend of those four buckets the right blend? If the team is under, let's say, a seven out of 10, there's pretty much a non-starter. If the team's only an eight, the idea, the product, and the market need to be 100 out of 100, basically, at that point to get over that eight. You're really looking for teams that are nines or tens out of 10 doing really interesting things after that. An entrepreneur has everything at risk. An entrepreneur has specific goals that they want to accomplish by doing something within a larger structure. And I think that that de-risks the, uh, the entrepreneur and allows them actually to, to thereby take more risk if they're willing to lose stuff. If, as an entrepreneur, you're not willing to lose your job or your position or anything like that, um, you're probably using the wrong word to describe yourself. I think the biggest key for a company looking to innovate is, is to give permission to the people that are put in charge of innovation. And without that explicit corporate permission, it's probably going to run into a wall at some point. And that means it needs to start at the top. And that means every single person above the innovator needs to be accepting and willing for that person to innovate. If that's not the case, someone at some point is going to shut it down because it compromises their stability. And their stability might be their job, their stability might be their control over a P&L, their stability might be just like the perception that they're the best at the company. Whatever it is, you can't run into that inside of a big company, otherwise innovation gets shut down. I think there are probably two ways. One is it's part of your internal corporate culture, and it just is what your company is. The other is spin it out. And so create a new office, create a new area, lock it off from everything else so that no one can touch it. And I think it has to be one of those two models. Anything in the middle, it just gets messy and ends up getting ruined. I think Budweiser has Budweiser Labs, and they've spun it out, and they've stuck it literally, or Budweiser Garage, the Bud Garage, I think. And they stuck it in a garage, and they put a bunch of employees on that and only on that. And their job is literally to disrupt the main business. And it's coming from outside in, not from inside out. And I think that's a really powerful model. I think the key to being a good mentor is to listen and to really not be a teller, but to be a listener than a reactor. And so every mentee needs something different. Some people just need a, a pat on the back or to be told they're doing OK. Others need advice. And so without figuring out what they actually want from you, I think it's really hard to be a good mentor. And the worst mentors do a lot of talking. The best mentors do a lot of listening. In my life, I've, I've tried to extract something from everywhere I've ever been. And so it's not about one specific person guiding you, but it's really about going to every place you are, even places you don't want to be, and trying to learn something. And I think that that's a really powerful approach to mentorship is saying, OK, even, this, even though this person isn't in my industry or doing what I do, they can teach me something. And so um, 
whether it's, it's work ethic, whether it's a, a way of problem solving, I think at every step of my life I've tried to extract something from it. I think how do you find a mentor is you're looking for one of two things. One is somebody you immediately click with and it's just somebody who you want to be around all the time. The other one is somebody who makes you think in a way that you've never thought before. And I think that both of those types of mentors have an amazing amount of value. And together, if you have sort of one of both or, or multiple of each, I think you, uh, you're in a better position because you're going to have people who you can lean on for support, which is one amazing uh, attribute that a mentor can provide. And the other is someone that can challenge you and push you. And that's another attribute that a mentor can provide. And I think that you know, that blend is really the, the key. An idea is going to morph, it's going to change, it's going to develop. The team that's building it is not. And the team that's building it needs to see it from two people all the way to 200, 2,000, wherever this thing ends up. And at the end of the day, your bet is can those people scale into that more than it is can the idea scale? I think within a big company, the biggest challenge is are you staffing a project with the right people? Are you putting the right people in charge of this innovation? And it really isn't around the idea, but it's around execution. And so are the people going to stick with it? Are the people going to go through the ups and downs of getting this off the ground? Are the people going to be willing to fight the corporate fight to get this over the hump? And if you put the wrong people in charge or the people who are too scared to fight that fight, it's going to get stopped. By nature, corporations don't innovate. And so unless there's permission to innovate, literally, or somebody to fight for that permission, uh, it's not going to happen. When you're innovating within a big company, you have to always remember you are in a big company. And that means there's continual politics at play. And so unless you're revisiting those politics and making sure you're on the right side of them every single month, you're probably on the wrong side of them. And that's a really dangerous thing. And I don't think that when you're outside of a company, that risk is at play. As an angel investor, my role is very different than a VC or an acquirer or a customer. Um, I see my role as really fitting in with what the entrepreneur needs. A lot of the time, that's friendship on the investor side. And I mean that. It's somebody who can support the entrepreneur with whatever they need. And why is that interesting? Because it breeds honesty. If you can be there as a friend, they're going to tell you their negatives. And those negatives are where you can actually impact and work with an entrepreneur the best. And without a trust as the core of your relationship, you're never going to get to those honest moments. And so I really do think friendship and, and support and connectivity as like a person to the other person at the table is probably the, the best thing you can provide. One of the awesome things about New York Tech is that this city is the home to so many industries. And as technology expands and, and penetrates into every industry in the world, New York becomes a natural place for a lot of that to happen, where you see the, you know, the hybrid tech plus, and it's tech plus fashion, it's tech tech plus advertising, plus marketing, plus you know, retail. And being in New York, you're at the epicenter for all these other industries that when you can take tech and smash it into them, amazing things will happen. And you know, being in a city where I at least believe the smartest and the most like, aggressive people in the world live, um, it's a really good place to be.